that has that particular document on it and literally do a side-by-side. The danger tips have led to the capture of 659 fugitives. Tonight on America's Most Wanted, America fights back. A tense standoff. But thanks to you, the cops get their man. And a family gets some justice. We were dancing and around the living room and swinging and high-fiving and really celebrating that this person's off the street and can't do anything like this to anybody hopefully ever again. And we know that he used prune juice and been taking prune juice to lose weight. To get through the hole so he could squeeze right through it. Exactly. He busted out of jail and cops say he's on a mission of murder. He hears God telling him to kill people and when you think you're hearing God tell you to do stuff, you just might do it. Now we're on a mission to take him down. Also tonight, how much pain can one town take? The devastating attack on Columbine High School left 15 dead. But just when the healing began, there was more violence to come. I get a call from my wife saying, there was breaking news that there was two dead bodies at a subway in Littleton. Tonight, you can help grieving parents find answers because tonight, America's Most Wanted is where America fights back. And now, John Walsh. Good evening. We just told you about a jailbreak we profiled on last week's show. Well, now another inmate escaped, but this guy's made no secret about what he wants to do next. He's on a mission to kill. Our Ed Miller has the story. John, we're here in central Illinois on the hunt for a dangerous escape prisoner. He busted out of this jail here, disappeared into the woods, and now police believe he is obsessed with the idea of killing. We need to establish roadblocks in all major routes leading out of town. U.S. Marshals, the FBI, major Illinois route. State Police, and officers from alcohol, tobacco, and firearms joining forces with the DeWitt County Sheriff to try to stop a potential madman and save innocent people from being killed. I think we've got the air search uh, and ground search covered in, uh, in 10 counties surrounding Clinton. The object of this manhunt? 44-year-old Clayton Lee Wagner, a doomsday survivalist who was serving time for stealing cars and guns. But even worse, cops say he is a violent extremist who brags about wanting to kill abortion doctors. When I spoke to him, Clayton's only regret was that he was caught before he killed somebody. That's what he said. That's very scary. Before he escaped, Wagner told Pittsburgh newspaper columnist Dennis Roddy about his plans for violence. Why is this guy dangerous? He hears God telling him to kill people. And when you think you're hearing God tell you to do stuff, you just might do it. What makes him extremely dangerous is he has made these threats and he is always able to procure the means to carry out these threats being firearms. He carries guns with him. That's correct. He has, he has repeatedly been arrested in possession of firearms. You will not be in the premise. You will be subject to arrest. This is your second warning. Wagner identifies himself with anti-abortion protesters. While abortion is a divisive issue, there is one thing that both sides in this emotional debate agree on. Both sides want to see Wagner back behind bars. He endorses killing. I mean, uh, he advocates exactly what we're against, which is killing and uh, violence. This is a very dangerous man. This man is not kidding. He is not fooling around. Uh, this is not a joke. Up until three weeks ago, Wagner had been incarcerated at the DeWitt County Jail in Clinton, Illinois. Inmates here are kept locked in their cells with the help of thick deadbolt locks. But two maintenance closets inside the cells were built with a different kind of lock. As amazing as it may sound, Wagner used a plastic comb to pop open the lock. It was just this easy. It was Wagner's first step toward freedom and something that now outrages the sheriff. This is not a small town jail with a lot of inept employees. This is a design failure. This lock should have never been in this facility. This lock here? That's correct. This lock should have never been in this facility. Inside a jail cell? Exactly, where it could be compromised with a plastic comb. 
Once he got through the door, he made his way up here to this attic area where he took apart a rooftop drain. But since that was too small for him to shimmy through, he used pipe hangers to cut the rubber seal around the drain. Jail officials believe each night in between bed checks, he would sneak up here to cut out a little more until he was ready for his final escape. He, he chopped a hole there and removed this grate and was able to get about an 18 inch hole or 17 inch hole to get up out of there. But this whole part came with it now that it's been repaired. We know that he used prune juice and been taking prune juice to lose weight. To get through the hole so he could squeeze right through it. Exactly. Wagner then ran across the jail roof and jumped off the side of the building, dodging security cameras along the way. This guy went out in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter. Residential burglaries, he's going to need clothes, he's going to need money. Police believe Wagner may still be driving this pickup truck, which they say he stole the day after his escape. Most likely it now has a different license plate. Abortion clinics across the country have been put on alert to keep watch for Clayton Wagner. Authorities believe his threats are real and need your help to track him down. With the years he faces in prison and with the statements he's made against the abortion clinics, he may very well think that he has absolutely nothing to lose. Here's a few clues. Wagner is soft-spoken and fancies himself an expert on the Bible and will try to correct the minister during a sermon. He also has a scar on his right knee and right ankle and likes to watch cop movies. If you know where Clayton Wagner is, call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Now, if you see Wagner, please be very careful. We've got to get him back to jail. So make that call to us or your local police. And remember, you can remain anonymous. And you know what? I think we're going to get him pretty quick, just like this next guy. He used a large dog and a long spear to make off with some big bucks. But as our Pat Lalama reports, he had no defense for your great tips. A tense standoff. A dramatic moment. But would police be able to capture a dangerous fugitive who terrorized an innocent family? It all began when a band of masked terrorists invaded a home near San Diego last November. As their Rottweilers stood guard, the thugs took a young single mother, her seven-year-old daughter, and a roommate hostage. It was all part of an elaborate bank robbery plot. The young mother, whom we'll call Alicia, was the manager of a local Bank of America branch. The spear-toting gang knew she had access to money, and they made it clear they had been stalking her for months. Some of the things that they described that they saw me doing in the places that they described us going to, literally watching us, you know, just made me physically, physically sick to my stomach. San Diego authorities say 25-year-old Robert Ortiz was part of the gang, inflicting the worst kind of emotional torture on their victims. The seven-year-old daughter was taken and placed in a closet with this dynamite device strapped to her back. The roommate was placed in one of the bedrooms with a dynamite device strapped on her back. And of course, the manager had a dynamite device strapped on her back. The subjects told the manager that if she didn't comply with their wishes that all three of them would be killed. Did you think you were gonna get out of this alive? <sighs> they were with us for a long time, many hours, and throughout the night there were several times no. While her daughter and roommate were held hostage at her home, Alicia was forced at gunpoint to drive to the bank. There was not one single move that I was gonna make incorrectly to put any of us in any danger, and I was gonna do whatever I had to do and follow every bit of instruction they gave me. Alicia was ordered to go inside and get cash. She also bravely and quietly managed to alert other bank employees who called police. My one emergency. My manager has been held hostage. So does she give you any description of these people? She said that they came in with masks and guns and threw them on the floor. The suspects took off with more than $360,000 cash. Alicia rushed home to find her daughter and roommate alive and unhurt, and the terrorists gone. Most of the gang members were quickly captured, but not Ortiz. He escaped with his pet Rottweiler. For three months, authorities couldn't find him. But all that changed when Ortiz was profiled on America's Most Wanted. 
Well, there was a tip that came in on America's Most Wanted that led us to an individual who in turn led us to another individual who was a pretty close associate of Ortiz. And that person told police that Ortiz was no longer in San Diego. He was now in Milwaukee. All right, guys, um, as you know, we're after Robert Ortiz today. Federal and local authorities quickly put together a plan to bring him in. They knew that Ortiz was inside this apartment building. It was immediately surrounded. We tried to negotiate, and we never got any response. Tear gas was fired into the building. But Ortiz held out for six hours until he finally gave up. When Ortiz was brought before a judge, he was anything but a tough guy. Thanks to our tipster who wants to remain anonymous, Ortiz will have his way. He was immediately sent back to San Diego. Did you see yourself on TV? Yes, I did. What did you think? I think I'm innocent. For the young victims of this cruel attack, the healing can now begin. What did you tell mommy when you heard the good news? Um, I was excited. You were excited? Mm -hmm. How come? Because cause they're all in jail. Um, it definitely brought some relief, some relief for both of us. We were dancing and around the living room and swinging and high-fiving and really celebrating that this person's off the street and can't do anything like this to anybody hopefully ever again. That will be the case if prosecutors have their way. Robert Ortiz and his co-defendants face kidnapping and bank robbery charges and may spend the rest of their lives in prison. Another great capture. Congratulations. So let's keep up the good work by grabbing some more bad guys we're going to show you when we come right back. Coming up next, he stayed at the bedside as his wife suffered in agony. She tried to commit suicide. But did he know the secret behind her suicide? Association here between his asking me about poisons and his wife being poisoned, it was too much. It was too much big a coincidence. And later, a quiet, studious young woman goes off the deep end. Emma killed your dog, poor little white girl. Don't you think she's better than me? And cops say she was preparing for a race war. These were in the uh, dresser drawer in her bedroom. Tonight, we set our sights on shutting her down. In the spring of 1962, Joe Maloney married June Fisk, who was studying to be a nurse. Friends say Maloney convinced June he was a medical student at the University of Rochester. It was the first of many lies to follow in a marriage that would be less than picture perfect. By 1965, the Maloneys had two children, but their marriage was in trouble. Worried about her husband's erratic behavior, June turned to Maloney's childhood friend, Neil Dunkelberg. Neil still lived in the neighborhood. An engineer and amateur chemist, he had a laboratory in his basement. June. What's wrong? It's, well, it's Joe. I mean, there are a couple of weird things that have happened. Uh, I want you to tell me what you know about Joe. Joseph was not a great believer in monogamy. Uh, he believed that his wife should be a great believer in monogamy, or his girlfriend should be a great believer, but he wasn't. By 1966, friends say June decided her marriage was intolerable. She moved out and took the children with her. Friends say Maloney couldn't handle the rejection. Not leaving me. Do you hear me? 
Never. <laughs> Friends say Maloney became obsessed with his wife and children. After June filed for divorce, they say Maloney's rage grew month after month. Police say Maloney then entered Neil's lab when Neil wasn't there. Yeah, but Neil's not home and he said that... Neil said I could have it. Neil had told him earlier about a poisonous chemical called methyl alcohol. This is just... And police say Maloney wouldn't leave the lab empty-handed. May 27th, 1967. Maloney demanded that June bring the children to his house. He would throw the party for Joe Jr.'s fifth birthday. How about a drink? Okay, fine, but that's it. We have to go. Sweet talk me, Joe. <sighs> mm. Police say June drank two screwdrivers, both spiked with lethal wood alcohol. Oh. What's wrong? I feel dizzy. Drink went to my head. Come on, let's, let's go home. Oh. The poison coursing through her body, June endured an agonizing night of headaches, nausea, and blurred vision. Kids ready? June, what's wrong? You know what's wrong. You put something in the drink. Another one of your chokes. As a registered nurse, June believed she could care for herself. Friends and family say she refused to go to the hospital. Over the next 48 hours, Maloney kept a vigil, urging her to see a doctor. Doctor. <clears throat> she, uh... She tried to commit suicide. Wood alcohol metabolizes into formaldehyde, literally embalming the victim. On June 5th, 1967, nine days after her son's birthday, June Maloney finally succumbed to the poison's lethal effects. Association here between his asking me about poisons and his wife being poisoned or sick or suicidal just, it was too much. It was too much big a coincidence. Suspicious police hey. searched Maloney's house. I can't believe this. You know that this is a mistake. I mean, my wife just died. Can we talk about this? Can I fix you gentlemen a drink? No thanks, on duty. this police found Maloney's fingerprints on a bottle that would later reveal traces of wood alcohol barely 12 hours after June's death Joe Maloney was charged with her murder indicted for first-degree murder Maloney still had a few tricks up his sleeve he demanded a psychiatric evaluation knowing he'd be sent to Rochester State Hospital, where security was minimal. September 25, 1967. Using a key carved from an electric shaver, Joe Maloney pulled one final prank. He simply walked away. This 1967 photo of Joseph Maloney is the latest photo we have, but a forensic artist developed this sketch of what he may look like today. Maloney has spent considerable time in Ireland and has worked as a car salesman. He's probably living under an alias. If you've seen Joseph Maloney, call us at 1-800-CRIME-TV. 
Up next, two pedophiles meet in prison. Now cops say they're perverts on parole. They have similar fantasies uh, of violence, of sex uh, with children, but particularly murder and torture and the pain to uh, young children. Maybe you can help them share something else, a jail cell. An accused killer on a rampage starts off tonight's All Points Bulletin. On May 29, 1999, gunfire erupted on a street corner in Hartford. The victim, an innocent man. 18-year-old Michael Patterson had been walking down the street minding his own business. Laquan Tucker Robinson, a drug dealer, was out looking for a man who robbed him earlier that night. Unfortunately for Patterson, their paths crossed. Patterson happened to be wearing a gray t-shirt that looked similar to the man who had stolen gold chains and money from Robinson. Witness accounts to the incident said that they heard what sounded like machine gun fire and Mr. Patterson was struck approximately six times. So it appeared that he was shot as uh, a result of uh, mistaken identity and um, it appeared that he had no idea of who he was shooting at at that time. Police say Robinson then fled from Hartford to Wilmington, Delaware, and set up his drug business again. Six months later, police say Laquan Robinson shot a second man because he owed him money, and then set his car on fire with the man's body inside. But Robinson wasn't done yet. Cops say he went to the man's fiance's house to collect the money he was owed. Robinson got into the house, and police say for no reason he shot and killed 24-year-old Monica Plant a Dean's List student while she protected her baby from gunfire. The family is furious that Robinson is walking free. Well, he's trash. See, we're not talking about an about African-American male. We're not talking about a human being. We're not talking about anything like that. This is a piece of trash, you know? And he should be treated as such. We couldn't have said it better ourselves. Robinson doesn't open his mouth in these photos, so you can't see his row of gold teeth. Let's get Laquan Tucker Robinson off the streets tonight. Call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. Take a good look at these two child molesters who are on the run together, Edwin Gunter and Frederick Everts. Oregon police say they've molested and raped dozens of children. Gunter appears to have a preference for young girls, um, but will... Um, is attracted to young boys also. Um, uh, Everts is, is almost exclusively attracted to young boys. Gunter and Everts met in a sex offender program in prison. Police say they stay together after they were paroled and began luring kids into their sick trap using internet chat rooms and tempting them with alcohol. These two apparently like to be together um, and they have similar fantasies. Uh, of violence, of sex uh, with children, um, uh, but particularly of um, murder uh, and um, torture and the pain of, uh, to uh, young children. Police say Gunter is so twisted he keeps a journal of his disgusting crimes. He even wrote about molesting his own kids and his siblings. Now, breaking news on this case. Just yesterday, Gunter was arrested in Florida, and get this, he was working at a carnival giving rides to kids. But the bad news, Everett wasn't with him. So if you've seen Everett, call us right now. They call him the Puffy Cheek Bandit. The FBI says he's managed to hit more than 25 banks over the past few years. He enters a bank very casually, very calm. 
Andrew Zetella waiting line. He'll wait five, 10, 15 minutes inside a bank. Eventually, when a teller waits on him, he presents that teller with a written, handwritten demand note. He takes the money and he casually, calmly, slowly walks out of the bank. So far, the puffy cheek bandit has struck in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Maryland, and Virginia. Authorities say he always uses the same MO. He robs the banks in the morning, choosing only banks located within a mile of a major road or highway. When the puffy cheek bandit is in a bank, he tries to blend in with the customers. Mostly, he's worn uh, a leather jacket, a three-quarter length black leather jacket, along with a collared shirt tucked in, many times a tie, uh, blue jeans or khaki pants, as well as a dark colored ball cap. Here's a good clue. After interviewing witnesses, the FBI believes the Puffy Cheek Bandit may be deaf and may not be able to speak. Puffy Cheek passes a demand note. The teller doesn't have what he's demanding. The teller will ask him, is this okay? I don't have what you want. Is this okay? He will respond as though he doesn't understand that he wants to verbalize something, but he just can't. So far, the puffy cheek bandit has gotten away with more than $100,000. In addition to his puffy cheeks, he may have a goatee or beard. If you know who the puffy cheek bandit is, call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. If you'd like more information on these APB fugitives or on any of our other cases, please log on to our website at amw.com. Coming up. In the wake of the Columbine shooting, another horrible crime. A grieving town looks for answers as more of its children are lost. I would like to see him caught, not so much for my closure, but this idiot's out there with the potential to do it again. When there's a school shooting like the one this week near San Diego, our thoughts can't help but return to Littleton, Colorado. But even as the nation was coming to grips with the massacre at Columbine High in Littleton, more bad news came out of that same town. Two more teens were murdered, and this time, the killer got away. The images are impossible to forget. On April 20th, 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold tore through Columbine High School, firing semi-automatic weapons at anything that moved. When it was all over, 15 people were dead, including the two teenage gunmen who turned their weapons on themselves. The town of Littleton, Colorado was changed forever. 10 months later, Littleton seemed to be on a slow but determined path to recovery. Then just up the street from Columbine High School, tragedy struck again. On February 14, 2000, at a local Subway sandwich shop, 15-year-old Nick Kunzelman was working the night shift. His girlfriend, Stephanie Hart, helped him close up. Hours later, Nick and Stephanie were still inside when three of their friends came by. Shortly after uh, 12.30, some kids uh, familiar with the store and employees of the store were driving by and recognized that the light was on in the, in the store, and they, they knew that was unusual because the store closed at 10 o'clock on Sunday nights. The teenagers drove around the store and came to the back door. They honked once, and just as they did, a stranger emerged. They said something to him to the effect of, hey, what's up? He didn't respond. They described that he gave a look that was rather intense, and then he fled from here just 
walked away very calmly to the northeast. One of the teens was suspicious. She went inside the store to check on Stephanie and Nick. She found both of them shot to death. <laughs> Later that morning, the victim's families got the tragic news. I get a call from my wife saying she just heard on the, on the news, there was breaking news that there was two dead bodies at a subway in Littleton. And just like that, the wounds were reopened. The familiar crime scene tape, the swarms of investigators, the unanswered questions, hundreds of devastated friends and family members. I honestly can't even really get angry at anybody at this point. Uh, it's just coping with it moment by moment. Uh, sometimes the moments last for a week. Sometimes the moments last for uh, seconds. <laughs> Now cops are looking for more clues, a motive, and the mysterious stranger who walked out of the subway shop on the night of the murders. This is the sketch one of the witnesses gave police. He's described as a white male, around five feet seven, 16 to 18 years old with blonde hair. The second witness gave police a slightly different sketch. In either case, finding this man may be the key to solving this mystery and bringing closure to a town in dire need of answers. I would like to see him caught, not so much for my closure, but this idiot's out there with the potential to do it again. If you can identify the person in this sketch, or if you know anything about the murders of Nick Kunzelman and Stephanie Hart, please call 1-800-CRIME-TV tonight. What a really sad story. But we've solved tough cases before. So let's work together and solve this one now. This town really needs some closure. Now, there's another fugitive from Colorado who we want to find, and we'll tell you that story when we come back. Coming up next. What the fuck you two? On the surface, it seemed like a neighborhood argument. Mom, I told you to keep your junk off my property. But it was just the first battle in a secret race war. And I am not afraid to die. You know, it was pure anger. I think she wants to kill me. I think she's psychotic. It was a moment of pure terror. Mario Betancourt had just been fired from his job at this Florida business when he stormed out to his van, grabbed a gun, came back to the shop, and opened fire. Police say Betancourt shot his boss, Rick Mashler, twice. As his co-worker, Kenny Conklin, tried to run out the door, police say Betancourt shot him five times, then walked back to his van. As he came out of the building and he put his gun in the holster and he held the gun up and said, I shot him, he seemed proud that he had accomplished his mission. After the shooting, police say Betancourt drove his 10-year-old daughter to the train station and left her there while he disappeared. The more time that goes by, the more frustrating it becomes. It it's just causes a lot of anger and frustration that somebody could do this, you know, and then walk away. And now frustration is mounting even more because Betancourt seems to be going crazy while on the run. It seems he's discovered that his ex-wife is dating someone new. Well, now Betancourt has called the Port St. Lucie police, threatening to kill the man. We certainly know that Betancourt is capable of anything, so we need to get him tonight. Betancourt has used two aliases in the past, Mario Romero and Jorge Contreras. If you have any information on his whereabouts, please call 1-800-CRIME-TV tonight. Our next fugitive was always known as a quiet, gentle person. 
but it seems she hid a very dark side. That's why no one in their wildest dreams could have predicted the crime she's accused of until it was too late. Our Tom Morris has the story. When Deborah Loisel bought this rundown crack house in 1997, she had big plans for it. Using her expertise as a civil engineer and her fiance, Jason Horsley's skills as a carpenter, they began restoring the 100-year-old Victorian structure to its original splendor. And he was pretty excited about fixing it up. He, he got into it. I think Jason had a better idea of how much work it was going to be. The house is in Denver's City Park West area. It's a neighborhood in transition that's just a 10-minute walk from the heart of downtown. I grew up with an all-white suburb, and I didn't really like it. We came here for diversity. In 1999, Deborah had her first experience with her new neighbor, Malika Griffin. Hi. A woman walked by that I didn't know, and I said hello, and she looked at me and gave me a dirty look, and kept walking. And at that point, she went into the house next door's yard. And I thought, oh, that's my new neighbor. And she walked up to the fence. And um, my dog barked at her. Come on. So I went to go get him. And she said, never kill your dog if he ever gets over here. Then Deb says Griffin started spewing profanities. Throughout the whole thing, she was being vulgar and giving me the finger and saying, bitch, bitch. Poor little white girl. Don't you think you're better than me? I said, I didn't say anything about skin color, and I don't even know you, so how could I think I'm better than you? Come on, Come on. Griffin had been quietly living next door to Deborah for three months before that bizarre run-in. But unlike Deborah, Griffin didn't move to the neighborhood for diversity. She just needed a change in her life. She had a good job in Michigan, and, she up and, and just moved to Colorado. I think she it was like two or three days notice at, uh, up there, and. Next thing, she's in Denver, Colorado. Griffin, a pharmacy technician with a magna cum laude degree in chemistry, was a quiet and studious loner. Um, this is me, and this is Malika. Gladys Hamilton was Griffin's college roommate and close friend. She always seemed like she was very strong. That, not saying that nothing really ever bothered her, but maybe she dealt with it in a different way and kept things closed inside. A few days after Deborah's run-in with the new neighbor, her fiancé, Jason, had his first encounter with Griffin. It happened as Jason was just getting home from his construction job. Jason, on a regular basis, would try and clean his truck when he got home so he'd be organized for the next day. Don't put your junk on my property. Did you hear what I said? It's the city right of way, lady. Jason didn't like to argue. Well, I was more of the type that would get in a verbal argument and try to make someone think rationally if they were being irrational. You're my problem. What's the problem, lady? You're the problem. You and your white bread, honey. I told Jason later, I think she hates me. I think she wants to kill me. I think she's psychotic. How did she look at you? It was just like, you know, it was pure anger. In the end, we'll have to fight. An anger Griffin's diary revealed was fueled by her secret hatred of white people. They are our enemies, and we must deal with them as such. Police believe Griffin was full of rage when she encountered Deb and Jason on May 18, 1999. But well, look at you two. What is this? Beverly Hills 90210? I told you to keep your junk off my property. She was trying to intimidate me. At one point, she got really close in my face. And um, I just don't back down. But I said, if you're going to hit me, I'm going to call the police. And then she turned to me and said, You know something? I don't do prisons, and I am not afraid to die. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you're not street smart. And I said, I guess not. I have no idea what you're talking about. You need help. I said, oh, maybe that got through to her. So I started walking in the house. You stay right here! She said, where do you think you're going? You stay outside. And I was just flustered anyway, and mad. And so I just walked in the house. You know, and then Jason, he uh, just kept tr cleaning his truck. Police say Malika Griffin emerged from her house a few minutes later. 
armed with a laser-sighted 9mm. walking right into the kitchen. I mean, it took me from there at the front door to the kitchen and I heard a shot. I went running out. Jason! I knew he, she he had been shot right away. And I think I put my face down close to his face and I touched his hair. When I touched his legs, it was like, you know, dead weight. And I think I knew he was gonna die. As darkness and the police descended on the neighborhood, Griffin took off on foot. Determined to get out of the area and thinking on her feet, Griffin ran into this alley, came over to the dumpster here, took off her jacket, threw it in, and disappeared into the night. Minutes later, a desperate Malika Griffin showed up at Monique Thomas's door. Monique, who'd only met Griffin once before, let her in. She's like, I need to use your car, I need to use your car. And at that point, yeah. she reaches under her shirt, pulls, pulls out the gun, and puts the beam on you. Yeah. And she knew that was the only way she was gonna get out of here with the car and the keys by pulling the gun on me. Cause other than that, she wouldn't have got away with it. And y'all would have had her down here for murder and me for whooping her ass. Griffin rolled out of Denver that night and vanished. You won't believe what detectives found when they searched Griffin's room. These were in the uh, dresser drawer in her bedroom. Her dummy hand grenades that had been, been uh, defused. And then she had a 9mm semi-automatic carbine in there that was fully loaded with hollow points. Detectives now believe this quiet chemist with no criminal history was studying the anarchist cookbook and the poor man's James Bond. There's a lot of things on surveillance in there, how to make booby traps, bombs, those type of things. Uh, bizarre books for a lady of, of her background. It seems Griffin was also writing her own manifesto for a race war she seems to believe is inevitable. Kill our enemies by any means, knives, guns. I have to get over this fear, fear of white people. We will, in the end, have to fight. There is no other way. I mean, she's given a lot of thought to domestic terrorist acts here. I mean, this is, this is quite clear what she's saying. To the things she had in her room. But incredibly, it seems that Griffin has never shared her racist views with anyone. She never said anything negative in front of me about white people. So who is Malika Griffin? Is she a terrorist, a racist, or is she suffering from some violent personality disorder? Nobody seems to know. Malika Griffin's wanted for the murder of Jason Horsley. Griffin's a brilliant chemist who could be working in a research or technology-related job. Griffin's been known to wear her hair in braids and dresses like a man. Detectives believe she may still be carrying a 9mm pistol with a laser sight. You know where she is tonight. Please, be careful and call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. It's the fastest growing crime in America. Internet prowlers steal your name, your vital statistics, and then they own your identity. But now you can fight back and protect your good name. It's John Walsh's Street Smart, an identity theft protection system that alerts you whenever anyone, anywhere in the country, tries to use your name. Check out the program for 30 days. If you're not convinced this is the best way to protect yourself from identity theft, return it and you won't be charged a cent. To order, call 1-877-AMW-GEAR or find us on the web at amw.com. Order today and for just $5 a month, you can be street smart.
Now, here's a quick review of tonight's cases. Clayton Lee Wagner escaped from the DeWitt County Jail in Illinois. Joe Maloney is wanted by the FBI for murdering his wife with poison. This man, known as the Puffy Cheeks Bank Robber, is wanted by the FBI for robbing up to 26 banks, including 18 in New Jersey. Laquan Robinson, also known as Michael Jones, is wanted by police in Hartford, Connecticut and Wilmington, Delaware, for killing three people, including a woman protecting her six-week-old baby. Authorities in Oregon say Frederick Everts raped and molested dozens of children. Denver police are looking for Malika Griffin for the murder of her neighbor. Police in Florida say Mario Betancourt murdered two people at his job and has just threatened to kill the man who's dating his ex-wife. And this police drawing is of a suspect in the murder of two teenagers in Littleton, Colorado. Tragedies like the school shootings this week make it seem like our kids and our schools are in chaos. But that's really not true. And for proof, we can look at the student crime stoppers of Palm Beach County, Florida. Since they began in 1994, this group of young tipsters has solved 43 cases, resulting in 26 arrests and the recovery of 16 weapons. We salute them and we wish them continued success. And remember, if you're a student and someone tells you they're going to kill somebody or bring a gun to school, please don't take it lightly. Tell somebody about it. I'm John Walsh. Thanks a lot for watching. And remember, you can make a difference. The FBI is on the hunt for Jose Trapala. Agents say Trapala caused a car accident that killed a woman, then fled. Trapala may be living in New York City. Call if you've seen him.